Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum, peace be unto you, thank you for tuning in. Last week we were discussing with Dr. Gerald Dirks, graduate of Harvard University. You can hear his story, how he came to embrace the way of life of all the messengers of God, which is that surrender and submission, sincerely, obediently, and in peace, summed up with one word, Islam. How he came to it on his special section at thedeanshow.com. And we have covered part one. You can go back to look at that. We're going to continue on talking with him when we come back here on The Dean Show. The topic is Jesus, Jesus peace be upon him, divine. Did he ever claim divinity? When we come back here on The Dean Show, part two to this topic. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. How are you? Good. Praise God. All right. Yes. Alhamdulillah. All praise and thanks to the creator of the heavens and the earth. And we are continuing talking about, for those who joined us last week, you gave an overwhelming amount of evidence supporting that Jesus, peace be upon him, never claimed divinity. We talked about this. We also covered that his disciples didn't look at him as a god. and some of the earlier Christian groups at that time mm -hmm. who believed in a adoptionist theory. Yes. This is a theory or the belief that he was known as a son of God, meaning a righteous servant of God. Is that how Jewish people at that time sure. would consider sure. it? Sure. And, 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 you know, we can look at how this whole misnotion yeah. uh, evolved. Uh, in first century Palestine, if you said so-and-so was the Son of God, everyone knew that what you meant by that was, this is a very righteous and pious and God-fearing individual. And that's all you were saying. That's all you were meaning. Uh, and like I say, the Jews uh, in Palestine all knew this. The problem that arose is when Paul took his particular brand of Christianity and began to teach it to the Gentiles, or the non-Jews, in Asia Minor, and more specifically in Europe. Mm -hmm. And when these people heard the word Son of God, it meant something very, very different to them than it meant to those Jews back in Palestine, who when they heard it said, yeah, righteous man, religious man, pious man. But when Greeks heard it, or Romans heard it, this conjured up images of the gods coming down from Mount Olympus, impregnating human women, and you have someone like Hercules being born as the result. So this was the context in which these Gentiles began to receive the message that Paul was bringing to them. Mm -hmm. When they heard that term, Son of God, they were saying, oh yes, I know exactly what you mean. We have our own stories of the gods coming down from Mount Olympus uh, and begetting children by uh, mortal women. So they took it in a very different direction. Uh, and that translation was never appropriately made from first century Palestine and Judaism to Europe. So when you take a language that's suited because did it not say in what we allegedly have in the Bible that Jesus is have allegedly said that I have not been sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel? Yeah, we have that statement in the, the Gospel of Matthew. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a story of a Canaanite woman. He's, he's uh, traveling and uh, a Canaanite woman uh, comes up uh, to him and starts shouting after him saying, you know, Lord help me, help me, my daughter is tormented by a demon. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, we're told, and Jesus did not answer her at all. Mm -hmm. And she keeps yelling. And finally the disciples come up to Jesus and say, you know, send her away. She, she's harassing us. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jesus said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And uh, the woman finally approaches him and says, you know, please, uh, you know. And Jesus says, y you know, again, I, I was sent only to the Israelites. You don't take the food that's meant for the children and, and uh, feed it to the dogs. Yeah. 
And the woman supposedly says yes, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Mm -hmm. And so we're told in Matthew, Jesus says, great is your faith, uh, be it as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. But the point is that he was saying, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And the people of Israel, the Jews, the people of Palestine, knew what Son of God meant, which was simply a righteous, pious man. So if you take that where he was only sent for the children of Israel, and now they can understand the language, Son of God, mm -hmm. as you had given that evidence that that meant a righteous person, and then you gave in part one all the evidence that the Bible literally has sons by the tons. Yes. And now you take this language and, the, and you take it outside of his immediate mission, and now we can give an example. For instance, if I take the slang, for instance, or the language of this time, and maybe I take it back or forward 100, 200 years, and for instance, you tell a person to, I need a lift, mm -hmm. right? So that would translate as, I need a ride. Mm -hmm. But somewhere else, they think of a lift, yes, elevator, absolutely. Absolutely. or, you know, this guy's bad. Yes. Now, that can mean that someone <laughs> say he's a bad person, but in another s slang, he's bad. He's like, you awesome. know, awesome, yeah. yeah. Another one is uh, Mary had a little lamb, mm -hmm. you know? If you take this literally, yeah. and this is just a story, or but someone would think that she actually gave birth to a lamb. Mm -hmm. So is this kind of the same thing, what we're saying, that you take a language that's suited for this time, yes. understood by this people, and you bring it over here by people who are already wor worshiping Sons, gods, Apollo, Jupiter, he had a son, Mithras, right. and now you can see how this gets all mixed up and confused. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, that is amazing. So tell us now, moving on, someone, because we refuted some of the evidence that someone tries to use saying that Jesus, no, 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 he, he is divine. And, and okay, we're going to, just for the benefit of doubt, someone's really sincere, we hope, and he has some other verses that are on the back of his mind. We want to clear these up. I and the Father are one. Tell us, someone might use this and saying, look, 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 he said I and the Father are one. Mm -hmm. And they want to support him being divine. What do you got to say? What does that mean? Aren't you and I one? In my purpose. wife and I are one. In a purpose, huh? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, to say my Father and I are one, what, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. You know, it's a very ambiguous statement. Yeah can be interpreted a number of different ways. Yeah. So, no one comes to the Father except through me. What does that mean? Through the message that Jesus taught. The same message that we as Muslims accept. That makes sense. How about he said, when they came to him, and he said, before Abraham was, I hear this all the time, I am, the famous I am now. And they compare it to the Old Testament where God, you know it better than me, with the Moses and tell him I am. Can you uh, expound on this? <laughs> well, they're, they're doing a little pun on words there. But as far as the pre-existence of Jesus, yeah. uh, that doesn't imply divinity by any stretch of the imagination. Mm -hmm. We as Muslims believe that all of Adam's seed, yeah. for of all time, had a spiritual pre-existence in which we testified to uh, God about his oneness, etc. Um, and so, you know, in that sense, we're, we're all pre-existent. Yeah. So this is, again, one of those that if you went to an average layman and you took that verse and you, like, showed it to him and you said, what do you get out of this? I don't think too many people are going to get that Jesus is divine or, you know, one with God. Would you? Well, again, it's a, we talked about it in an earlier show. There's this concept in psychology called the Rorschach test. Rorschach test, yes. Which is a series of ink blots on cards. You hand it to a person. You say, what do, what do you see in this? Well, whatever the person sees, whether it's a cloud or a, an animal or a butterfly or, or what have you, is something that they themselves are projecting onto the ink blot. Mm -hmm. And so many of these verses, you know, my father and I are one, and no man cometh unto the father but by me. 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know, th these are all Rorschach cards. Yeah. You're going to get out of them what you're projecting into them. What you really wanted to say, you're seeing that. Yeah. But if you're going to use that standardized across the board, it's not the same as some of the other verses that are actually unequivocal where maybe you can help us out with that, where he's clearly making a distinction between him and God. Oh, there are a number of such verses. Can you uh, give us some of those? Well, sure. We can. Uh, in fact, why don't I enlist your aid here, brother? Because uh, I wrote a few of them down. I thought mm -hmm. this might come up. Yes. And uh, let's see, beginning here where it says uh, uh, biblical verses supporting subordinationism. Mm -hmm. If you want to just read off uh, what it's asking for, I'll try and look it up real quickly. Yeah, you got here in Mark 10.18. Okay, let's see what Mark 10.18 says. Um, and I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. I mean, that's, that's kind of, you know, not leaving room for, you know, too much interpretation. I mean, it's straight to the point. Yeah. 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 Tell us uh, John 5.19. This is John 5.19. Uh, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, the Son can do nothing on his own, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. The Son can do nothing on his own. So if he's God... He should be able to do everything. Sure. I mean, and he's saying that he can't do nothing. Yeah, he's clearly saying he's subordinate to God. Okay, we don't need, actually, even your master's degree to figure this one yeah, out. Yeah, it's, it's right there. Of, yeah, okay, how about John uh, 30? 530. 530. Okay. Again, words of Jesus, supposedly. I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek to do not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So he, if he's God, who's he being sent by? Now? Yes, exactly. Okay. And again, can do nothing on his own. John 14, 28. Okay. You heard me say to you, I am going away and I am coming to you. If you love me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father because the Father is greater than I. Very clear, very unambiguous. Yeah. John twenty seventeen. I like this one. This John twenty seventeen. I Okay. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. So, the, so if there's any equivalence here, it's between Jesus and other humans. Yeah. Clearly, he's uh, telling you that he's going to your God and my God. Yeah. And, and he's not God. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Jesus praised the God, it says in Matthew 14, 23. Oh, yeah, we have many, many examples of that. I, I don't know whether it's worth uh, reading all of them, yeah. but uh, Matthew 14, uh, 23. Uh, and after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, uh, and so forth and so on. And, and the issue is, you, you pray to someone, obviously you are subordinate to them. Yeah. You know, you, you are uh, of a lesser status, certainly, a lesser rank. How about if someone says, you know what, and I've heard this before, that he was teaching them how to pray to God, to himself. What well, one, one, one could make the argument. Yeah. Um, he certainly did a lot of repetitive teaching then. Yeah. <laughs> how about, how would you explain, and I've heard this mentioned before also, that Thomas had came and worshipped him, said, my Lord and my God. Yeah. Very ambiguous. Mm-hmm. Oh. Tom, surprise me with something. Anything. Uh, you, um, you're pregnant. My Lord and my God. <laughs> now, wait a minute. What, what, uh, what does this mean? Yeah. You know, am I simply doing an exclamation? Uh -huh. Thomas sees Jesus. He thinks Jesus is dead. Yeah. Jesus is right there. Yeah. He says, 
My Lord, my God! Uh -huh. uh, what do we interpret from this? Yeah. Uh, okay, so we have overwhelming amount of evidence that is clear, unambiguous, unequivocal, showing that you don't really even need a master's degree in theology to see that, hey, you know, Jesus is making a distinction between him and God. Oh, absolutely. And then you have other verses that are, you know, verses that are equivocal, that they're open to many interpretations. Absolutely. And why do you think people that they tend to want to take these to really try to justify this belief if you got all these other verses that are clear? Well, again, I don't, I don't want to imply that people are deliberately, yeah. you know, uh, cherry-picking biblical verses, etc. Yeah. I think the thing is you have to appreciate people who have probably raised in Sunday school, etc. Yeah. You know, they've been taught from the word go a certain view, etc. And, and when they read biblical verses that are ambiguous, they quite naturally and automatically project onto them the sort of story that they were taught back in Sunday school when they were children. So it's kind of just wanting to stick to what maybe your grandparents, forefathers, you know, you're defending something that, you know, you just want to really fit, you want to make sense, and, I mean, you, does a person just go to any bounds to, to do that, you think? No, no, I, I, and again, I think you're implying more intentionality than yeah. there often is. Uh, I mean, people have been trained to understand things in a certain way. Yeah. By virtue of their, you know, going to Sunday school every Sunday as a kid, etc. Yeah. Uh, and going to vacation Bible school, etc. Yeah. And so when they read things, they just naturally read them with that interpretation in mind. Uh -huh. It's not that they're willfully distorting uh, or willfully trying to prove a point. Yeah. I think as much as it is they've been trained to look at it this way. Mm -hmm. And they, they have never stopped and checked themselves and said, now wait a minute, what are all the different possible ways that this verse can be understood? Yeah. You know, they're, they're sort of going on automatic pilot yes. based upon how they were taught, how the story was presented to them when they were children. Let's explain to the people now really who Jesus was and who God is. The true concept of God that I think if any rational person, sincere person, when he hears this, it's just going to fit with what God already embedded in all of us. Well, we as Muslims mm -hmm. believe that God is one. And, and that's a very emphatic one. Uh, that he is incomparable. Nothing can compare with him. Mm -hmm that he is greater than anything you can name. Yes. Which is what is meant when a Muslim says, Allahu Akbar. Yeah. God is greater. He's greater than this. He's greater mm -hmm. than that. You can't compare God to anything. And as far as conceptualizing God, you know, we humans, our minds are too too minuscule, too finite. We can't ever get a totally comprehensive mental understanding of God. He, he's beyond our human intellect. That is the greatness and the majesty and the awesomeness of God. But there are some things we can say. God is unity. God is one. God is love. This is one of the names of God we find in the Quran. Al-Wadud, the loving God is the loving. God is the uh, compassionate. Ar-Rahman. Yes. Another one of the names for God mentioned in the Quran. God is the merciful. Ar-Rahim. Another one of the names of God mentioned in the Quran. So we as Muslims see God as one, as incomparable, as being a loving, compassionate, and merciful God also a just God, yes. but a God that is loving, compassionate, and merciful. And the true nature of Jesus, what does a Muslim believe about this messenger? That Jesus was fully human, but that obviously as a prophet and messenger of God, he stood in a special relationship with God. 
one that uh, those of us who are not prophets and messengers uh, are not fortunate enough to have. Yeah. But someone who has been given a direct revelation from God certainly is standing in a closer proximity to God than, than uh, the rest of us uh, mere mortals are. Now, you had talked about identity in your story of how you came to Islam. How can someone overcome? Because I'm sure when they hear this, it just makes good old common sense. Mm -hmm. Again, you graduated from Harvard with a Master's in Divinity, but I don't think a person needs that Master's in Divinity to just use the tools that God has given them. Mm -hmm. When you de just define who God is yeah. and His pure oneness, His absoluteness in that oneness and His mercy, and it's not something that is too complicated. You don't have to do all this mental gymnastics to try to make this fit. Mm -hmm. But now it's the identity. Now a person is nervous. This is like what I know. This is what I do. This is what, you know, they feel like this is me. And now they get stuck with this. How do they overcome this? Well, first of all, let me uh, reinforce what you were saying. Mm -hmm. The Quran says that the, the signs of God are all around us. Mm -hmm. You know, all we have to do is stop, take a look around us, and begin to contemplate the world that God has created. And we'll find God. You know, the Quran talks about Abraham, peace be upon him, reasoning to monotheism by naturalistic observation, by studying the, the skies. Yeah. Uh, and he was able to reason, apparently as a, a youth of about age 14, mm -hmm. reasoning to absolute monotheism. So yes, the signs are all around us. And, and those signs are available to everyone. Now, what happens when a person gets to that point of saying God is one, mm -hmm. one and only one. But boy, you know, I've been raised as a Christian. Yeah. You know, what are my parents going to say? What are my aunts and uncles going to say? What about my friends? Uh, and, and my goodness, do I have to start wearing this, you know, slip-like dress and wearing something on my head. And You're not wearing do, any of that. No. I'm not wearing any of that. Do I have that? to change my name? Yeah. You know, no. The answer is no to all of those things. And, and I would uh, say to uh, our Christian friends who are listening, who may be thinking about Islam, uh, you know, don't, uh, don't let an overzealous Muslim tell you you have to change your name. You don't. Or tell you you have to dress and Middle Eastern clothing. You don't. Or, or try to convince you to be more of an Arab than an Arab, or more of a Pakistani than a Pakistani, uh, or more of an Indonesian than an Indonesian. You don't have to do any of that. You know, if you were born here, you were raised here, you're an American. That's your identity nationally and culturally. Keep it. Actually, you probably don't have much choice in that matter. But keep it. Uh, there's nothing uh, antithetical about being an American in national cultural identity and being a Muslim in religious identity. You know, Muslims have been in this country for centuries and have contributed significantly to this country for centuries. So th there's no conflict between being an American and being a Muslim. Rest assured on that point. Tell us, you have some of these books, wonderful books. You've authored so many books. And where can someone to read some of your material, where can they go? And if they want to contact you to come out maybe and speak at a public lecture, how can they get a hold of you? Uh, the easiest way is to contact me at my website, which is uh, dirksonlinebooks.com. And uh, there's a way there to contact me with email. Also a way to, to order each of the books as well as the one book my wife has written. Which one do you recommend for somebody with just the basic knowledge to so, start with? Yeah, someone who is just wanting to learn about Islam. Yeah. You know, at a starting level. I would recommend the book that you have your hand on. That's the... Which uh, is uh, Understanding under Islam. Under Islam. A guide for the Judeo-Christian reader, uh -huh. and that would be the book. Now, someone who's wanting to tackle issues like, is Jesus, uh, peace be upon him, divine, which we talked about this time, or was Jesus crucified, which is something we talked about previously, um, I would suggest that they get either the Abrahamic faiths, 
That's this one, the yeah. Abrahamic faiths. Yeah, where both of those issues are talked about, uh -huh. or the cross and the crescent. Okay. Where both of those issues are talked about. That's this book, yes. All right, and you can visit our brother, Dr. Gerald Dirks at dirksonlinebooks.com. Yes. And we hopefully, inshallah, God willing, we look forward to doing some more programs with you because everybody's just gotten to benefit so much from the knowledge that you have. We'd like to thank you once again for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you. Jazakallah, so may God Almighty, the creator of the heavens and the earth, Allah reward you in abundance. And we'd like to thank you for being sincere, wanting to know the truth, and I hope that you continue on your miss mission, searching for the truth. For those of you who already know what the truth is, try to every day live it and be the best example that you can be so other people can see you living the truth and they can see it in your character, in your behavior. And then they're going to want to ask questions. What are these people on? They're honest. They have great integrity. They don't lie. They don't backbite. They don't gossip. They stay away from gambling, from fornicating, from all the different evil vices around the world. And then they'll come to know that you're living the way of life that all the messengers of God live. You're being humbly and sincerely submissive to the one who created you. Not to a man, to a woman, but the one who created man and woman. Not to the sun, to the moon, but the one who created the sun and the moon. You're praying like Jesus prayed. You're praying like Abraham prayed. You're a Muslim, one who has consciously surrender and submit it to the one God. In Arabic, that's a Muslim. It's very simple. It's a unique way of life. It's for everybody. And we hope that you got to benefit and you keep coming back. Until next time, Assalamu Alaikum. Peace be unto you.